For the fifth proposition of Book 2 of Euclid's Elements, if a straight line be cut into equal and unequal segments, the rectangle contained by the unequal segments of the whole, together with the square on the straight line between the points of section, is equal to the square on the half. So basically, if we have some straight line, in this case the line AB, and we first cut it into equal sections, so at this point C, namely that AC and BC are equal in length, and we also cut it into two unequal sections, the section AD and DB, then what we're trying to prove is that if we were to form a rectangle between the lines AD and BD, these unequal parts, and we add this to the square formed by this short section here, CD, then this would be equal to the square on the half, or the square on either AC or CB. And just as a note, when I write squares out for now on, I'll be using just a square and two little marks to denote that the sides in this quadrilateral are all equal to each other. So these are both squares here, though for rectangles I'll continue to write which two lines essentially form the rectangle. Now if you want to consider this more algebraically, we can call this line AC, we can call this alpha, and we can call this short side CD, this can be beta, and remember that BC would just be equal to alpha since it's the same length as AC. So what we're trying to prove is essentially that if we first take alpha plus beta, so the line AD, and we multiply it by the line BD, and BD would just be this whole line alpha, which is just BC, minus this part here. So in other words, BD can be rewritten as alpha minus beta, and when we add beta squared to this, what we get back would just be the square on the half, or alpha squared. So by proving this statement, we're essentially proving this statement as well. So let's first start this proof by drawing a square using the line BC. And we can call this square C, B, F, E, and we can construct this square because of book one, proposition number 46. And let's also connect the lines, or I should say the points, B and E, and we can do this because of postulate number one. And at this point, we'll have to create some parallel lines. So let's start by creating a line through the point D that's parallel to the line BF. And we can label this point here, G, so that DG, the line, is parallel to the line BF. And this comes from book one, proposition number 31. And we can label this point here, point H. And then through this point H, we want to create a line that's parallel to the line AB. So I've created this line KM that's parallel to AB, and I've also created this line AK that's parallel to the line BF. So let me write both those in, that the line AK is parallel to the line BF, and also that the line KM is parallel to the line AB, and we created both of these parallel lines with book one, proposition number 31. Now, let's look at this parallelogram here, this square that we drew, this CBFE. And notice we have this diameter here across a parallelogram. And it's true in any parallelogram when you have this diameter that these parallelograms here, these two, these are known as the complements and they're always going to be equal to each other. So we can say that 
the parallelogram CH, this one here. So CH would be equal to the parallelogram here, which we can call HF. And this comes from book one, proposition number 43. So at this point, let's take both of these parallelograms and add this parallelogram, which we can call DM, to both of them. So common notion number two says basically that if we add things that are equal to things that are equal, then the final results will be equal to each other. So in essence, we're just adding the parallelogram DM to each side of our equation. But if we add DM to the parallelogram CH, then we end up with a new parallelogram, which is just CM. So the parallelogram CM would then be equal to HF plus DM. So here's HF and here's DM. So we get a new parallelogram, which we can call DF. So the parallelogram CM is equal to the parallelogram DF. Now, what you can also notice is that since we know BC and AC are equal to each other, and we also know that this parallelogram and this parallelogram, you can notice that since they have equal bases and they're within the same parallels, so they both end on this line here, KM, and they both start on the line AB, then we know because of book one, proposition number 36, that these two parallelograms are equal to each other. So we can say that the parallelogram AL, that's this one here, is equal to the parallelogram CM. And through common notion number one, things which are equal to the same thing are equal to each other. We know that all three of these parallelograms are equal to each other. And that is common notion number one. And at this point, let's again use this common notion number two. And this time we're gonna add in the parallelogram CH and we're gonna add it to DF and AL. So we're adding the parallelogram CH where we're essentially starting with DF on the right and AL on the left and adding this parallelogram CH to the parallelogram AL will just give us this bigger parallelogram here, which we can call AH. So the parallelogram AH is now equal to this parallelogram DF, so this right here, but we're adding CH to it. So let me just write that down, that we have the parallelogram DF and we added the parallelogram CH. Now, this shape right here, these essentially three parallelograms added together, this is what's called a gnomon, and we'll be seeing a lot of it in book two. But basically this gnomon, this is one of Euclid's two definitions that he introduced for book two. Now, to finish this proof, what we have to recognize is that this shape here and this shape here, these are both squares. And this is actually going to come up a lot in the next few videos. And if you noticed in the last video, we actually had a very similar situation where we created a square and then had a diameter bisect that square. And you end up with these four parallelograms within. And in the last video, we actually proved that this one and this one, these are both squares. So I won't write down the argument, but I'll go through it briefly. And the essence of it is that if CE and DG are parallel lines, then EB is a transversal and this angle here and this angle here will be equal to each other. And from here, what we can notice is that since this BCEF, this is a square, then BC and CE are equal to each other. And we essentially have an isosceles triangle here. So if opposite sides are equal, then the angles opposite those sides are equal as well. So this angle here 
and this angle here are equal to each other. And within this triangle here, if these two angles are equal to each other, then the sides opposite them are equal as well. And in parallelograms, opposite sides and opposite angles are equal. So that would make these, ang these sides equal as well. And at this point, you just need to prove that all the angles are right angles, but this angle here you know is a right angle, and opposite angles and parallelograms are equal, so this here is a right angle. And then basically because DG and BF are parallel lines, then this angle here and this angle here have to add up to two right angles. But if this one is already a right angle, then this one would have to be one as well which implies that the angle opposite is a right angle. So all the angles are right and all the sides are equal. And this is gonna be true whenever we have a parallelogram, or I should say a square, where we've created a diameter across it. And the two shapes that are connected essentially to this diameter, this one here and this one here, both of these are gonna be squares if the bigger figure is a square. Now, the entire reason that I went through this is that, like I said, we'll be using it again in f the next few videos, but for this particular problem, we just needed to know that this line DB is equal to the line DH. So let me write that down, that DB is equal to DH. And with this fact, we can now write out what AH is composed of, or essentially which two lines contain the rectangle AH. So if we look at AH, which is right here, it's composed of the line AD and DH, but we already know that DH is equal to DB. So we can say that this rectangle AH is contained by the lines AD and DB. So let's write that down, that the rectangle AH is contained by the lines AD and BD. So we now have all of the pieces we need to finish this proof. So let's refocus on this line here. So we have that this rectangle right here, this AH, this is equal to the gnomon right here the CH plus DF. And at this point, let's add this square down here, this LG, to both sides of the equation. Because on the right side, when we add it to the gnomon, what we get is just this square. So let's just write this down. So on the left, we get this AH, which we know is the rectangle composed by the lines AD and BD. So both of these lines contain the rectangle and we're adding to it the square up here, the square LG. But LG is just the square formed by the line DC. Since the DC would be equal to LH here because we have a parallelogram and opposite sides are equal. And we know this is a square because it's on the diameter and this entire parallelogram is a square. So this square LG is really the square contained by the line CD. So we can write that, that we're adding the square contained by the line CD. And this is equal to the parallelogram DF plus CH and then plus this square LG. So we're just adding all of these parts of this big square here. So this large square is actually just the square contained by the line BC. So this left hand side is equal to the square contained by the line BC. But BC is also equal to AC. So we can say that this rectangle and this square also add up to the square contained by the line AC. And you can see that if we go back up to the statement we were trying to prove, this statement here, that we were able to get it successfully. 
So we can end our proof here with QED.